Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to, uh, to a new session, a round table, on uh, the successes and challenges of cyber capacity building coordination. Um, so uh, today we'll tackle uh, these issues uh, related to um, strengthening uh, the cybersecurity posture, uh, resilience, uh, as well as cyber skills and competences, uh, which is the coordination of efforts uh, aimed at enhancing uh, cyber capacity building. Um, so in a world where, uh, as you know, uh, state-sponsored cyber attacks, uh, cyber crime, and cyber incidents are uh, proliferating, uh, governments, uh, multilateral organizations, uh, private sector entities, uh, and international bodies are allocating substantial resources uh, and funding uh, to bolster uh, cyber capacity building. Uh, developing nations are receiving uh, vital support uh, to fortify uh, their cyber defense capabilities, um, encompassing the ability to detect cyber threats, uh, promptly report on cyber incidents, and respond effectively uh, to cyber attacks. Um, however, uh, with the proliferation of projects and initiatives in this domain, uh, coordination of cyber capacity building efforts has emerged as a challenge. Um, the task of aligning uh, strategies, priorities, uh, and supported activities uh, among donors, recipients, and implementers in the realm of cyber capacity building uh, has grown increasingly inter intricate. And we'll try to discuss uh, all these things uh, today. So our session aims to explore both the achievements and difficulties associated with coordination in this cyber policy area. Uh, today, we are privileged to be joined by a distinguished panel uh, representing not only um, various actors from the Internet Governance Forum space, so government representatives, civil society, technical community, but also actors from the cyber capacity building community that are defined somehow in a slightly different way because we have got recipients, donors, and, uh, and implementers. And our speaker also from different regions of the, of the world. Um, together, we'll address questions related to the complexity of cyber capacity building coordination. Uh, we will explore what are the repercussions of inadequate uh, coordination in the field of cyber capacity building, and we will share what are the existing mechanisms designed to enhance coordination in this sphere. And then we'll identify also what actions can donors, implementers, and recipients take to improve the coordination of cyber capacity building efforts. And of course, most, import most, uh, most importantly, we hope that many of you in the room uh, will have the opportunity to actively contribute to, uh, to our uh, discussion. And we hope you will share also your own experiences and recommendations for enhancing coordination mechanisms in this uh, cyber policy area. Um, we also would like uh, to, uh, to prepare at the end of this session a policy brief, which will be shared with many stakeholders. Uh, in this area, uh, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, the, the German Agency for International Cooperation, other agencies dealing with international cooperation and cyber capacity building, the European Commission, recipient nations, implementers, and ongoing projects and initiatives. So, uh, without any further ado, uh, we can start the conversation. Um, so, I will let all panelists to briefly introduce themselves when answering the first question. And I will simply go in the order of the, um, of the table. So um, let's start with, uh, with Rita. Uh, thank you uh, for, for joining us. Uh, so can you tell us why it is difficult to coordinate cyber capacity building projects from your perspective? Um, thank you so very much for the question. And it's really a pleasure to be in this forum today too. Like, um, share my views pertaining to um, capacity building projects. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Rita Madioba Dumeling, and I work for the Botswana National CSIRT. Um, I'm actually a CSIRT respondent, and yeah. Uh, before I can like jump into the, your your the answer, 
I would also like to emphasize what uh, really cyber capacity building in campuses, right? Cyber uh, capacity um, building, it, it, it actually encompasses all initiatives that actually drive towards the development of um, necessary skills, um, necessary capabilities, as well as the infrastructure that will uh, ultimately or effectively address any cyber security challenges. Now, to go back to your question, uh, why is it difficult to co coordinate uh, cyber capacity building uh, projects? One pressing issue uh, that uh, ultimately affects both uh, developing countries and as well as uh, developed countries, it's actually um, the rapidly evolving cyber landscape and its complexity, right? We are living in an enormously, uh, uh, trem tremendously um, evolving uh, a technological ad, uh, uh, era whereby we are seeing the emergence of new technologies um, and these technologies are however um, taken advantage of by, by threat actors. So in, in, in such cases we are seeing uh, emergence of uh, sophisticated threats, sophisticated um, vulnerabilities. Now, therefore, in this uh, dynamic environment, it rather becomes a challenge in this uh, in coordinating, uh, in especially in reference to like. Um, strategies and priorities. Uh, there are strategies and priorities that are uh, implemented to address issues that come with this, uh, that, uh, that are uh, actually uh, faceted to addressing cybersecurity um, uh, issues. But uh, adapting these strategies and priorities or policies rather is um, a challenge because of the, the, the dynamical the dynamic environment. And this, however, especially for us developing countries, for example, Botswana, it's, it's rather expensive in the sense that uh, in order to like be agile or keep up to speed with uh, addressing issues pertaining to these emerging threats, uh, pertaining to these sophisticated uh, vulnerabilities. It requires a lot uh, of funding. It requires a lot of like training, um, um, uh, cyber security experts in order to like try and keep up with this uh, emerging uh, um, challenges. And then, um, in, in addition to that, like I've mentioned, there is like a lack of capacity, especially in Africa. Uh, we lack capacity um, in the sense that we do not, uh, there is no like tailored training that is actually um, intended for different aspects of cyber security. So those are one of the pressing challenges, but we, um, as for emerging uh, or, or this constant um, or the evolving threat landscape, we are seeing that it also impacts uh, countries such as uh, Estonia, which is which is um, highly known for its great strong cyber security um, posture. So in essence, uh, complexity and rapidly evolving landscape as well as resource strain, uh, constraints are a challenge, uh, especially for uh, emerging, for, for, for de um, developing countries such as uh, ourselves, Botswana. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Rita. Rita. I think it's clear that there is a need of, of support, so there's no doubt of that. And because of these complexities and evolving cyber threats, um, and some organizations are also try to, to, to improve the the, the, complex, the complexity around the, the, the coordination of these efforts for supporting countries like Botswana. So for instance, uh, Teresa, one of the main goals of the GFC is somehow to support coordination. So what's your take on that? Difficulties and, and everything else and challenges. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Enrico. Thank you also, Rita, for uh, for setting us up with uh, with some really excellent points. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so my name is Teresa Horisova, and I'm from the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, the GFC, uh, working mostly on our regional hubs and uh, regional efforts. And um, building on what you said already, uh, I will try to provide a little bit more, yeah, maybe frank uh, assessment why uh, why it is difficult. Um, 
frankly speaking, uh, this is uh, the cyber capacity building efforts. It's quite a tough and very competitive uh, environment. Um, that's why, uh, you know, for kind of all the actors involved, be it um, the donors, uh, be it the implementers, uh, or being the recipient countries, kind of the intuitive answer is that less sharing will mean more projects, will mean maybe more control about what type of projects uh, are delivered, uh, and uh, so on. And um, uh, that's a problem. Yes, we will, we will get later to why it is a problem, because uh, when we are uh, in a situation that uh, there is not enough sharing, that also means that one project does not build on another project. Uh, we do not connect, uh, con connect the dots uh, uh, as, we, uh, as, we, uh, as we should. So uh, that's, that's why uh, it is difficult to, to coordinate. Um, we also, and you, you pointed to it a little bit, Rita, that um, in many cases, um, it's very supply driven, the capacity building support that is being provided rather than demand driven. So uh, I still think uh, there is a lot of room for maneuver in listening uh, to the recipients uh, of cyber capacity building support uh, on what uh, their needs uh, actually are, rather than presuming uh, that uh, we, you know, on the other side, uh, know what the needs are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, for, I think it's very interesting to highlight this issue of the competitive environment. There is a lot of competition, actually, even if it's, um, and uh, yeah, it's clear, really, also working from an implementer point of view, because uh, I've been working for a, for a project delivering cyber capacity building, and it's clear to see that there is competition, because, I mean, the funds, even if they're there, available from a number of sources, are also somehow limited because these projects also require a substantial amount of funds to really deliver on the promises. That's also the, uh, the reality. So Claire, then from, from your perspective as a government representative, uh, what do you think about the complexities and challenges of cyber capacity building coordination? Thank you, Enrico. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Claire Stoffels. I'm the Digital for Development Focal Point at the Luxembourgish MFA, and within the Directorate for Development Cooperation and Humanitarian Action. So first of all, I wanted to thank you very much for inviting me to participate to this panel on this really relevant topic on which I hope I can share some, some useful insights with you from a donor perspective. Um, so from my experience, I can definitely say that uh, cyber capacity building coordination uh, is lacking amongst uh, stakeholders, uh, that we face a lot of challenges when attempting to coordinate, notably diverging objectives, approaches, uh, duplication of actions. Um, there are, however, a number of positive efforts uh, that have been undertaken, which I will get to a little bit later. Um, but first of all, um, cyber capacity building uh, coordination needs to be driven by several parties from within, uh, meaning it requires really an inclusive, uh, demand-driven and context-specific uh, approach by which ownership uh, is fostered among stakeholders at both national and regional levels uh, in order to create uh, sustainable change. I think this encapsulates really uh, a key challenge in uh, cyber capacity building coordination efforts. So as I said, um, they, they require, it requires a, a regional approach and because it transcends so many communities of practice from technical incident responders to cybercrime police to civil society educators, um, it's really challenging to gather all relevant parties around the same table. Um, but beyond getting everybody to sit at the same table and to actually discuss, um, one needs to also recognize that the success of cyber capacity building uh, coordination processes is contingent upon um, operationalizing the consensus at international level and reflecting that in national policies and practices in a way that aligns with uh, national and region regional socioeconomic and security uh, priorities. Um, then another, another essential component to uh, cyber capacity building coordination is trust. So it sounds very basic, but trust is definitely a necessary component for practical cooperation um, between stakeholders. However, trust can be challenging to establish when working across so many different policy fields and institutions. And trust can be built through transparency and accountability. And I think uh, Luxembourg has historically been perceived as uh, neutral and trustworthy, and this is definitely um, had a positive effect on relationship building and developing different initiatives in the cyberspace. 
Um, and finally, one of the biggest challenging uh, biggest challenges that that I've had that I've encountered in the past um, in the past year um, has been the development also of of scalable models to establish uh, mechanisms to coordinate capacity building efforts. Um, and this is basically, how it comes down to how a project can be developed uh, sustainably in the, in the future. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Claire, for highlighting uh, yeah, the requirement of an inclusive approach, um, uh, success contingent also to consensus at an international level that then needs to be translated in national policy also on possibly coordination of uh, cyber capacity building um, uh, projects. And then trust, trust is so important, right? Trust in cyber security is a world recurring theme across so many uh, issues and also on cyber capacity building. So thank you for that. Um, Anatoly, what's your, what's your take on the, on the challenges on cyber capacity building coordination? Hello everyone. <coughs> I'll try to oversimplificate things. So cybersecurity, from my perspective, it's about good people who are protecting computers against bad people. So the main goal is to teach that good people to have the right value, the, the right ethics, and to, to be able to, to have the right skill to, to do the, the engineering of the process. So the, the fundamental problem is uh, to deal to people, it's, it's difficult, it's hard to plan, it's not like building a, a construction or a, or a road. You have to, to adapt to the speed of learning of, uh, of the people that you have in, um, in charge to, to cybersecurity process. So what happening very often, uh, the donors uh, have the timeline for the, uh, for the project and they, uh, they can't adapt to the speed of, uh, of learning, to the speed of, uh, of the humankind. So they're starting to buy tools. They, they're buying more and most, more sophisticating cybersecurity tools. It's easier to manage the project in this way, but you miss the, the, the main purpose. So you miss the, the humankinds who are fighting uh, against, uh, let's say, the defects in the, um, uh, in, in the cyberspace, in the engineering of the cyberspace. So paying more attention to the people in the process, it's, uh, it's the main thing that can help with this uh, complex puzzle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Another key issue. So this this issue of the of the timing of the project, right? Sometimes you don't give enough time actually to a project to uh, to allow to reach to to in terms of uh, improving skills because the the learning curve might be might be slower. But there are specific uh, requirements, especially from a uh, from a donor perspective. But I think the recommendation of actually focusing more on the people and what they can you know how much they can learn in how much time would be probably a better way of approaching project rather than having very specific and strong uh, deadlines. Also probably from a donor's perspective, unfortunately that doesn't always work, but we can try to, to discuss that a little bit uh, more. Um, Hiroto from, from JICA, another donor organization and dealing also with international development. What do you think about the challenges? Thank you very much, Eniko. Um, I'm Hiroto Yamazaki, uh, Senior Advisor on ICT and Cybersecurity at Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA. So JICA is an official um, uh, development assistant agency and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So latest, uh, recently JICA is, uh, has been involved in bilateral uh, co technical cooperation uh, related to cybersecurity, uh, mainly in Asian region. So over the past five years, actually, the technical cooperation has been implemented in Vietnam, Indonesia, Cambodia, Philippines, and Thailand, and so on. So today I'd like to share our experience from the JICA's activities. So, I have three points on the difficulties on the coordination of cybersecurity uh, capacity building. So first one is that there are simply too many organizations or stakeholders to coordinate. Some of them may not be globally identified, uh, which makes uh, coordination difficult. So cybersecurity has many communities divided into several layers, such as a private versus uh, uh, government, technical and policy, and country or region. So in some cases, discussions among development partners do not include the communities of specialized uh, security organizations such as the FIRST or IPCERT and so on. So in addition, not all organizations uh, participate every time. So even when a group of organizations coordinate something, there will always be the organizations that are not included, so making it impossible to fully 
coordination. So I have some examples. So JICA attends the de uh, regional coordination meeting. So since 2020, uh, 2009, 2009, Japan and ASEAN have established the framework of the cyber security policy meeting and working group. So this meeting is held four times a year. So at the meeting, a capacity building session is held uh, to share what kind of uh, capacity building uh, each organization is implementing and to exchange our opinions. So this works well, uh, but generally uh, we cover the, the cooperation for government agencies. So, but does not include the support from civil organizations, private companies, and the international organizations such as the first or the uh, uh, APSAT, except for the JPSAT coordination center. Sorry, I have a lot of example, but the uh, time is almost up. So I have one more uh, reason. So we are the bilateral uh, cooperation agency. So our cooperation is based on the bilateral agreement between Japan and the lesbian country. So even if we could coordinate something with other development partners or donors, we still basically have to try to follow the lesbian country's approach, strategy, and their needs by respecting lesbian countries' ownership. So sometimes it makes it uh, difficult to coordinate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Aroto, for, uh, Iroto, for highlighting the number of stakeholders that actually a donor organization is supposed to, uh, to coordinate. Uh, but I think it's a very interesting uh, mechanism, what you described, the regional coordination meeting. I think that could, uh, that could help. Also, as you said, including all stakeholders might still be uh, challenging. Um, Luis, from your perspective, that I believe it's primarily academic, uh, what's your experience and uh, yeah, your take on the challenges on cyber capacity building coordination? Thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, my name is Louise Marie Urell. I am a research fellow in the cyber program at the Royal United Services Institute. So for those of you who don't know RUSI, uh, shorthand, uh, it's um, a security and defense think tank based in London, but we work globally across different regions. And my own background, I worked in, in think tanks and mostly focusing in Latin America and the Caribbean. So hopefully um, I'll be talking from that regional perspective, but maybe also talking a little bit more, as Enrico mentioned, from a, a more scholarly academic perspective. Um, so as a person that has been, you know, in the position of being an implementer in many ways of different capacity building initiatives, you know, thinking that implementation is not something that's only conducted by different governments, but all different stakeholders have a place of implementation when it comes to cyber capacity building initiatives. I think what I've observed in the past couple of years is that, you know, we use the term cyber capacity building, but in fact, we're talking about evolving mechanisms, right? So there are MOUs that should be in place so that governments can then activate it and build an agenda bilaterally. Uh, we're talking about multi-sided kind of multi-donor funds that are being established. Uh, we're talking about, you know, coordination among civil society organizations that are working in conducting cyber capacity building um, and academia, the private sector, um, and other colleagues at the international level also kind of um, developing agendas on that. So I, I think I have three key points. Um, what I have observed as well in terms of the context is that, you know, many donor countries are in the second or third wave of developing programs for capacity building. So they're also restructuring the way in which they're doing um, and, and establishing, let's say, funds within the government. So which departments you need to bring together. So I think that's something quite interesting. Um, and, but while you see, like, for example, the GFC, the Global uh, Forum on Cyber Expertise, has a civil portal where you map all of the different, let's say, capacity building initiatives that are publicly kind of recognized. You know, while we see lots of programs, coordination doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that's something that's necessarily there. Uh, but the first point that I would say is that um, I think there needs to be a better understanding of like how coordination happens amongst countries that are willing to support. Um, so from a supporter perspective, one big challenge of coordinating investments in a particular region, right? So I think there's some countries from a donor perspective that would be more interested in some regions and some more in others. And whenever there's, you know, uh, you know, no coordination among them, it's very hard to see, you know, you have one country that's receiving from multiple other countries. So how do you actually make, sh make sense that you're not overloading the recipient country um, because they also have to coordinate amongst themselves. So I think, you know, duplication is something that we really need to think about. Uh, the second point is really domestic buy-in um, as a person that has, as I said, you know, worked in Latin America for many years. 
Um, political buy-in is something that's quite fundamental. So if you don't have political visibility over these capacity building programs, it's very hard to ensure sustainability of implementation, right? You might have a civil society organization or a think tank, as I would use to work, um, trying to implement and bring visibility to cybersecurity capacity building. But then if the government doesn't see that as a priority, sometimes it's very hard um, to gain traction. So I think that is a very real challenge to thinking about coordination and sustainability. And the final point is really, um, I think we need to break down the term cyber capacity building a bit for us to have a better conversation and more focused conversation. So maybe we might be challenged on the coordination element because we need to break that down. So I would break it down into at least three different sub-categories um, as a good academic that I am. Um, so there's the traditional cyber capacity building. We're talking about skills. We're talking about you know longer term projects or short term projects that are looking at, let's say, more whole of society approaches. Um, a second element could be CCB for crisis response. So for example, Costa Rica having to respond to a large scale incident, right? This is a very different context of thinking about capacity building and investment in a particular recovery scenario. And the third one is capacity building for conflict or you know, post-conflict recovery, which as we've been seeing like in Ukraine, for example, uh, it's a whole different landscape of investment and also capacity building efforts. So I think we need to break down the discussion around capacity building into the context in which it is applied. You know, it's very different when we're talking about peacetime and maybe conflict or crises triggered by a particular incident. Second, domestic buy-in. We need to ensure that there's political buy-in. And third, you know, coordinations amongst countries that are willing to support, given regional priorities for each of them so that we don't duplicate efforts. So these are my three key points. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Luis. Many yeah, uh, interesting and um, thought-provoking um, points, and especially I think also on uh, having a little bit more of granularity, right, on the term of cyber capacity building, because all these efforts, of course, have got different um, goals. And I think it's a good, your categorization between uh, skills, uh, cyber capacity building for crisis response, and for conflict or post-conflict uh, recovering. Um, Regina, based on your on your experience um, as a cyber uh, diplomat, uh, what do you what do you think about the challenges on cyber capacity building coordination? Thank you, Enrico, and um, yeah, I'm Regina Greenberger, the German cyber ambassador. Um, I would subscribe to almost all the elements that have been mapped out here as parts of the difficulties that we that we meet when coordinating cyber capacity building. And I would like to add perhaps four more. Um, so the first one, also from a donor's perspective, this is spoken from a donor's perspective, it's actually difficult to fund cyber capacity building projects. For us um, in Germany, this is, I mean, we what is this, the 18th IGF? So I think uh, there is uh, quite a lot of time uh, that has passed that we uh, that we meet uh, the needs, but in the foreign office, it's still a new topic, and it's for us a new experience to really go into the details of cyber capacity building. But we realize that it is not only capacity building for the sake of increasing cyber security, but capacity cyber capacity building is also a diplomatic tool to strengthen our partnerships. Uh, to strengthen uh, the stability of cyberspace and by thus also um, the security of us all. So it's difficult to fund CCB projects because it needs a political willingness to do so and the political willingness depends on the risk awareness and you know many people in the dis decision making level of um, of uh, of the foreign office for example are not as risk aware as people you know in the basis like uh, like Rita described it from CSERT. Uh, the second reason is of course budget risk uh, restraints and then the third reason is that we have a very short term planning cameralistic planning for one year uh, only and uh, we have midterm needs and even long term strategies as you described when you broke down what 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 is actually capacity building so our planning period is a little bit contradicting the recipients uh, hor horizon and then the last element 
that makes it difficult to fund is the deckability of the expenses. So because this is uh, not um, not always within the definition of what is then ODA, so uh, uh, of development assistance in, in, in the definition of the OECD, um, we have to take it from other, uh, other funds, other titles. So uh, another element that I would like to add to the difficulties is we need to free human resources to do that. So it's not about money only, it's also we need resources, experts. We have uh, established um, an EU cybernet, which should be a platform to find an expert and also to develop train the trainers programs, but uh, this, is, this has really come out of the experience that we, we don't have enough people to implement uh, cyber capacity building measures. The th third element is transparency. It's what we need is a transparency and what we experienced is that, for example, when we invest in trust funds to fund cyber capacity building measures like with the World Bank, we are really missing that kind of transparency, transparency that we understand what happens with the money and what do the recipients do with it. And um, the last element that I would like to mention here is what we are also need needing to really coordinate effectively is we have to know the needs of the recipients, which uh, requires them expressing and admitting and expressing um, their needs and often it starts with the cybersecurity strategy that is missing that would give a structure to what are the needs in this particular place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regina, for sharing really from a donor's perspective uh, the difficulties to, to fund um, cyber capacity building projects. I think uh, you, know, you touch upon the political willingness from a donor's perspective and Louise is the political willingness from, from, from a receiver perspective. Sometimes there is a, there is a mismatch there. And um, um, issues of transparency also very important because there is a need of understanding what's happening with the money. So probably you know, having monitoring and evaluation mechanisms while the project is implemented could, uh, could help that. And, um, and also very interesting point that uh, let's not forget the cyber capacity building are also a tool, a diplomatic tool to strengthen partnership and working on security issues with, um, uh, with other countries. So um, then let's move on to try now to, um, to understand what, um, what can be the, the consequences of this uh, insufficient coordination in cyber capacity building. For instance, Rita, uh, from your perspective, um, your organization, the National c is primarily a recipient. So if coordination is actually insufficient, what are the repercussions for your own organization? Okay, thank you, Enrico, for that question. Um, as a member of the National CSET, I have had uh, a first-hand experience and exposure to the repercussions of insufficient um, coordination, coordinating um, cyber capacity building. So um, what we have identified or what we have come across is um, insufficient co coordination um, ultimately leads to a disjo to, to disjoint uh, cybersecurity efforts, thus leading to um, gaps and vulnerabilities in the country's overall cybersecurity posture, making it easier for cyber criminals to and uh, malicious actors to ultimately exploit um, such weaknesses within the cyber 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 post, uh, cyber posture. And then um, another um, consequence could be um, there could be like insufficient resource allocation. For example, if uh, different or multi-stakeholders within a nation do not like come together, coordinate towards um, cyber uh, security, cyber security capacity buildings, uh, resources may be wasted, or there could be um, duplicated efforts or they could be misallocated areas with less priority. And this inefficiency could ultimately uh, limit the overall effectiveness of uh, cyber security programs. And then um, with insufficient coordination, there's certainly limited information sharing. Um, because 
effective cybersecurity um, entirely relies on timely and accurate information sharing between um, different entities, that is, between different uh, stakeholders such as government agencies, uh, civil sectors, or or private sectors, or even international um, partners. So if there is insufficient coordination, this can like hinder sharing of threat intelligence and then making it harder to detect and as well as respond to, to cyber incidents. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Rita. Those are really um, yeah, um, worrisome points uh, because some, some, somehow it seems that lack of coordination could result in uh, deteriorating the cyber posture of, uh, of a country because you really touched upon issues of uh, limited information sharing, increasing cyber vulnerability. So then the effect of cyber capacity building could be contrary, completely contrary to, to its final um, goals. Um, yeah, uh, Teresa, from, uh, from your perspective, there are also some mechanisms at the GFC, like the, the, the clearing, house, clearing house and, and others. So what are the, uh, the repercussions of insufficient coordination between all these uh, actors? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And I know I feel in an answer to this question, we will be kind of reconfirming <laughs> a lot what, the, what you have said. So uh, yes, uh, what are the consequences? Less impact than we could have. Uh, and definitely insufficient use of the limited resources uh, as several uh, donors uh, on this panel uh, have already uh, uh, stressed. So um, there is a lot of duplication going on and uh, um, uh, if you're a recipient, um, you know, you might have got into situations that, uh, yeah, the kind of the same or very similar project was offered to you by various implementers in some cases not knowing that this has been uh, delivered uh, or donors uh, trying to also support a project that might have been uh, delivered in that given uh, country too. Um, another maybe point worth mentioning is um, that um, we are often overwhelming the recipients because if there is not sufficient uh, coordination, imagine that for every single project, an implementer would come and for instance, would want to do a needs assessment for their particular project. And uh, needs assessment is so time consuming and uh, uh, in this sense it's very unfair uh, to overwhelm already limited capacities, for instance, in a, in a given country. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a bit maybe utopic, utopian uh, uh, to expect um, that uh, if needs assessment is uh, deliverable in your project that you would be sharing it with other implementers. I understand that uh, this is like a um, probably not a, not a typical situation, uh, but I feel it is a topic uh, that we that we really really need to talk about. Yes, um, and do you want me to go to the mechanisms now or or later? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So uh, yes, I mean uh, now. Sorry that I will be talking a little bit uh, about the GFC, uh, the organization I represent, because. Um, you know, for those of you not familiar, uh, we are kind of a platform for actors involved and interested in, in cyber capacity building, over 200, 200 uh, members from all stakeholder uh, groups. And the main um, idea actually is exactly providing a platform that hopefully naturally will lead uh, to more exchanges, uh, more, more networking, uh, more conversations uh, about, uh, about cyber uh, capacity building. Uh, a few uh, concrete mechanisms uh, that we have experimented with uh, have, for, for instance, and you, you've named it, Enrico, uh, been the clearinghouse mechanism, uh, which uh, in practice means that, um, um, let's say, a government would express a concrete demand or need that they have, uh, and we would try to kind of clear it through the richness of the network that we have uh, at the GFC, connecting uh, uh, to uh, to the right implementers. In an ideal case scenario, uh, connecting to the to the right donors. Um, uh, it's not uh, straightforward, for sure. I mean, the idea is probably good. Uh, the practice can be, of course, uh, very complicated. But we feel this is this is an experiment uh, that is worth uh, playing with further. We also uh, try to organize various donor alignment meetings in various uh, regions uh, where we also try to uh, kind of provide space uh, for donors uh, to, uh, to come together uh, and talk and kind of exchange notes. Um, 
again, it's, uh, it's also delicate and tricky. And it is uh, unrealistic to expect that uh, also donors would, uh, uh, would come uh, and share all their uh, intentions and plans and strategies. Uh, but we feel uh, that, uh, that there is maybe some progress uh, that, uh, that is being done in this uh, regard. And if the GFC can have a minimal role in helping to facilitate the discussion, uh, we would be very happy uh, to continue doing that. Uh, another mechanism that we have available for uh, for the community is the Sybil portal, which is available free of charge uh, at sybilportal.org. And uh, this is a space where we kind of try to provide mapping of what are the projects um, available for a specific topic in the field of cybersecurity, for a specific region uh, of cybersecurity, for a specific country as well. So it's possible to kind of filter and uh, play around. Um, uh, the resource will be more valuable uh, the more comprehensive it is. So uh, of course, I cannot say that we have 100% of projects everywhere covered. It also relies a little bit on the implementers and donors sharing with us this information so that we can feed it in the platform. Uh, and of course, it also relies on us and our agility uh, to keep the portal as uh, as up to date um, as it can be. So th this, this can be kind of a basic resource to see, okay, let me see what projects in the field of, I don't know, cybersecurity skills have been implemented in Botswana by whom? What was the angle? So it's sybilportal.org. Uh, um, I uh, also, of course, have to stress a little bit our regional efforts. So uh, I've talked about it a little bit, you know, that we really think there should be more of this demand-driven capacity building. And then it's not something that should be happening kind of like from the headquarters somewhere, uh, but being really much closer uh, uh, to the situation on the ground uh, is essential, which we are trying to tackle through our uh, regional hubs. Uh, and uh, maybe to conclude, you know, a general mechanism uh, and also building on what uh, what others have said, uh, Regina, you, you, you've, uh, you've been very frank in your response, is the kind of short-term, long-term planning, yes? Um, uh, if we have project, you know, that is a quick fix on something, but uh, we don't have the sustainability outlook, you know, uh, in a way it's also Mm, not as impactful as it could be in the long term, which I feel is uh, is the common goal of all of us. So sorry, I took more time. No, no thank you, um, thank you, Teresa, for for sharing. Um, so there are many mechanisms available from the uh, from the global forum on cyber expertise, um, uh, the, the clearing house mechanisms, um, the, the regional uh, donors uh, meeting. The Sabel portal also is a great resource because all the information are publicly available. Uh, you've been collecting um, data and information for a number of years, so you've got actually uh, an historical perspective, and uh, that's really available from, for not only donors, but also for implementers, for recipients, and I think it's a great way of increasing transparency for the, uh, for the broader uh, global community dealing with, uh, with cyber capacity building. So information is there, it is available. Sometimes it's also a matter of making an effort uh, interestingly enough, I believe that there are still organizations and donors that do not know, unfortunately, uh, these tools, uh, but I believe that those are somehow also the foundations to, to try to improve uh, these, um, these mechanisms um, globally. So I really invite everybody uh, in, the, in this room, if you are involved in cyber capacity building, to have a look at these tools before embarking in your, in your next project, because that could really help you um, improve the, um, the coordination efforts. Um, Claire, so from, uh, from your perspective, uh, what are the consequences of this um, insufficient coordination? And, um, and then I don't know if you would like also to talk about some of the, of the mechanisms to, to improve the, the coordination. Um, yeah, so I don't want to, to repeat anything that's been said already, the excellent points that were made. Um, from a donor perspective, um, there's definitely obviously a risk for duplica duplication and lack of coherence because of the proliferation of actions um, in the uh, cyber capacity building space. Um, so therefore, coordination is essential to increase uh, situational awareness and allows to learn if some of the needs identified in a country or that will be identified by the project have already been addressed by other uh, CCB projects. So that's why also platforms like the ones from the, from the GFC are essential, um, especially for countries like Luxembourg where we don't have as many resources to identify 
uh, what's being done, what's being carried out by other by other stakeholders in in the in the field. Um, so I want to address some some mechanisms. So um, I just said so as, as a small country again with limited resources, uh, Luxembourg really has to foster uh, multi-stakeholder approaches across sectors, uh, not just in development cooperation. Um, within Digital for Development, um, cyber capacity building is one of our main intervention sectors, and it's a, it's a key priority really at national level, and it's reflected in our policies, in our administrations, and in our private sector, and it really has trickled down um, into development cooperation. And we therefore, together with our implementing agency, LuxDev, as well as other actors, we fostered a lot of, of partnerships um, to carry out CCB, um, sorry, capacity uh, building interventions. Um, we've coordinated efforts uh, with also our our si national cybersecurity agency in the framework of, of our projects, really because we try to identify which needs and gaps can be filled by different um, partners that we work with. Um, at European level, Luxembourg is a is a founding member state of the Digital for Development Hub, which you might have heard of. So it's a global platform that was launched by the European Commission in 2021 which aims to foster digital cooperation amongst EU member states uh, to promote digital transformation in our in partner countries. Um, so the Digital for Development Hub works on different uh, thematics among and has um, basically different working groups dedicated to those uh, thematics, which aim at uh, fostering discussions and initiatives among which uh, cybersecurity. Um, so Luxembourg shares the co-lead of this uh, thematic working group with France and the European Commission. And um, the purpose of these working groups really is to provide a forum for information and best practices sharing and experience sharing between member states. And we try to involve as much as we can different uh, external actors as well on a regular basis. And it has been more or less um, successful. So successful in the sense that it has created an informal forum uh, for technical levels to exchange and share practices uh, less successful in the sense that I would say that most European member states still have limited resources dedicated towards digital for development, and therefore I don't think it has reached its full potential yet in terms of how much information, knowledge sharing, and coordination capacity um, it could carry out. Um, allow me to share maybe just an example of how the cyber thematic working group can actually work in practice. Um, so the European Commission is currently uh, formulating a new project focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa with one component on cybersecurity and one on e-governance. Um, happy to get into the, the details a little bit later. Um, and in parallel, Luxembourg, we're formulating a project at bilateral level with our implementing agency, LuxDev, um, and the African Union Commission with similar uh, complementary actions. So our respective formulation teams are in contact um, now also with the, the uh, African Union Commission and other stakeholders on the ground to ensure that both projects are actually complementary and make an efficient use of uh, resources that basically we don't also duplicate needs assessments, that we can actually base ourselves on one single needs assessment, um, that we ensure that we have the same contact points within the African Union Commission so that we don't, basically that they also feel that we are coordinate, coordinated on our side and that we're not, that it's not going in every direction. Um, so we were able basically, as I said, to share uh, this information and our respective objectives through this uh, thematic working group, um, which is, um, I think, a, quite a good example of how that can actually work in practice. And then um, Luxembourg has also joined other coordination platforms or, or practitioner groups such as the GFCE, the EU Cybernet as well, which is um, a great platform as well. And, and those have proven to be very beneficial, um, again, for a country where we have uh, limited resources dedicated to D4D and small administrations to carry out uh, these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, for uh, highlighting some of uh, additional efforts from the, from, from the national and, uh, and European perspective. Maybe not everybody is familiar with this Digital for Development Hub, which is this um, European Union mechanism uh, between uh, member states, where, as Claire said, they can share, uh, you know, what are their priorities in terms of digital development and assistance to, uh, to, to, to various country, countries. Of course, as you said, it's got its own challenges, but it just started also in 2021. So I think it's good and significant to see that there is an effort 
towards trying to improve um, coordination of um, um, of these um, of these efforts. So yeah, thank you for providing um, concrete examples from. Um, from that point of view, and of course also um, the issue of uh, national coordination and the problem with uh, lack of, um, of enough um, resources, as also Regina uh, I highlighted before. So, yeah, Anatoly, from, from your perspective then, uh, what are the consequences of this insufficient coordination, and uh, can you highlight some of other uh, mechanisms in place uh, to improve coordination that maybe we, we do not know? Thank you. Yeah, I, I like to start with uh, elaborating a little bit on what Teresa just said about the competition of uh, of donors. What what I seen in the last year since I'm serving my prime minister is uh, sometimes the beneficiaries are are losing the point. They are losing the scope of the project. So we see the project as a as a process, but we 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 miss to to remember why we started this uh, this project, because you know when. Uh, when you, the scope of the project is just to buy some hardware or software, it's very clear. You have a shopping list, you split the shopping list between donors, you buy it, you put it in place, and uh, expect people to use it. It's more complicated when you have people involved, because sometimes you don't, you, you have, for example, training, uh, uh, training program, but you don't have enough brains to put that knowledge in, so you have a shortage of people to, to train. I, I can give you um, a, an example why, uh, why it's happening that sometimes the people don't fit the projects in cyber we have. We had the discussion with, with the European Commission, especially on the, on the topic of uh, nationwide approach when we have to improve the cybersecurity in the regions, in, in the local authorities. And uh, I discovered that the same problem is not just in Moldova. The same problem is, for example, in Estonia because of... Uh, uh, of uh, this big um, decentralization of power. You, you have local authorities which have a big autonomy, but in the same time with this autonomy, they have to serve themselves. And what we discovered that the, the cyber or the IT in general in, in the regions is handled by private companies. So uh, the commission say we can't uh, invite non-public uh, servant in trainings for cyber. And we had now to find the mechanism to fit that employees of private companies who serve the infrastructure of the states in the regions. And it's not easy because you have to find the legal mechanism and to re rebound the, the project scopes. So um, as I just told in my previous blog, uh, to, to work with people is hard. And when you have uh, technical people is more, is more hard because they are special. <laughs> Uh, the, the solution to that is obvious. Uh, you need a better planning, but it's not the planning that the donors have to do. It's the planning that the state actors have to do in terms of uh, making this wish list to the donors. And yeah, that, that's the solution. Uh, regarding the, the mechanism, we, we developed in the last, let's say, half year or, or maybe eight months, we developed the following mechanism. So since 2015, we have the discussion that uh, the prime minister need a one single point of contact person in his office to, to be the, the window to, uh, to, to the state. So uh, they found that uh, they, uh, that person is myself, and I organized the, the council of uh, cybersecurity in the, in the prime minister office. And uh, the, the vision of the prime minister, we are spreading across the, um, uh, across the institutions. We, we are spreading it to give uh, the understanding what we wish to achieve and to give this clarity that uh, sometimes is missing in uh, all cybersecurity projects. Uh, another mechanism that we have, it's small groups. Because uh, this council, uh, usually it's, it's between 30, 50 people. And when you have in the same room 50 people altogether talking, it's not efficient at all. So that's why we have this, uh, the council usually is meeting every month. We have uh, every two month meetings uh, with, with a shift uh, from uh, different donors. Usually it's happening in small groups. It's around, I don't know, five, seven people. And these small groups are, are delivering the peer review between projects and between activities of the donors. And, and it's very, very efficient because they can adjust their, uh, uh, 
uh, their steps in uh, in delivering the project. So uh, after having all this, um, uh, let's say, coordination and uh, identifying what have to be done, it's already our Ministry of Economy and Develop uh, Economical uh, and Digital Development. Uh, of economical development and digitalization. Uh, so uh, this ministry is putting all that in the policy and it became a law or a government decision to be, uh, to be, to be, to have it on, on paper, let's say. So uh, this uh, three layer mechanism is very efficient uh, for now. We'll see how, uh, how we'll move with the critical infrastructure because critical infrastructure is beyond the cybersecurity and we'll need extra coordination because it's, it's, it's a different profile when you have to, to take care about cables and uh, uh, other physical stuff. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Anatoly, for, uh, yeah, I think highlighting um, some very um, important issues. So um, I like the point on the need for a better planning, you know, not only from the donor's perspective, but also from a state actor's perspective, right? Because sometimes, as we have uh, highlighted also before, there might be some lack of transparency, uh, transparency at, at that level. And I think some of the mechanisms that you have identified at the national level are really great and probably could be replicated also in other um, contexts. I like the s s small working groups because, of course, I believe that we have all been part of several working groups, so probably working with, uh, with less people uh, might be easier and more efficient, right? And then, of course, probably in your role, trying to coordinate all these um, smaller groups, I think it's something very concrete that other um, countries or mechanisms could actually try um, to, uh, to, to replicate. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And also, I think the importance of another point of the of the recipients that are not only or always uh, government officers, but might be also private sector uh, representatives. And that might create a, a problem of uh, formality from the European Commission perspective, because actually they cannot really directly support them. So the difficulties then from a recipient perspective of trying to find legal ways to, 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 to let them understand that actually those are somehow acting as public sector employees because those are the people dealing with uh, cyber capacity issues um, at the national and, and government level. So thank you, um, thank you for, um, for that. Uh, Hiroto, from, yeah, once again from, uh, from JICA perspective um, in terms of uh, yeah, consequences of insufficient coordination from, uh, from your uh, experience and uh, what mechanisms did JICA put in place to improve uh, that? Thank you very much. Uh, from the uh, development agency's perspective, so inadequate coordination in cyber security uh, capacity building will lead um, negative effects such as the reduced efficiency, uh, non-maximized non development impact, and lack of sustainability. So looking at the negative effects uh, in more detail, we can see, so uh, previous speakers already mentioned the duplication assistance, and lack of the resources, or the too much resources, or uh, the siloed approaches to assistance, and so on. And I skip some uh, other parts, but uh, conversely, uh, by promoting coordination and cooperation, uh, it is possible to uh, eliminate these uh, negative e effects. So I have uh, two examples. One is a kind of the bilateral effort. The other is a more multi-stakeholder uh, effort. So regarding the duplication of assistance, so the, I, I have an example from the Cambodia. So our project uh, started in May this year, and uh, this project included uh, assessment activities for the national C cert, uh, but it was discovered uh, that the Cyber for Development uh, had conducted already it a few years ago. So in this case, so since the project had not yet started, so that we had a chance to talk uh, with our Cambodian partner and Cyber for Development, uh, so that so then uh, we could. Uh, we decide to use the result of the cyber for development instead of conducting the same uh, assessment so that we could uh, reduce the uh, duplication of the assistance. The other example is more um, about multi-stakeholders. So um, um, Japan, uh, I mean the JICA, uh, is conducting the uh, technical cooperation project in Thailand. So there is a training center in Thailand that is called ASEAN Japan. Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center called AJCCBC. 
established in 2008 or something. So uh, in this uh, training center, uh, we are coordinating with the ASEAN member state countries and ASEAN secretariat so that uh, we conduct the training at least uh, six times a year and also CTF contest to meet their needs. So in addition to providing, uh, in addition to training, provided Japanese uh, training company or training institute, uh, we also uh, discussed with other uh, donors or other partners. So this uh, AJCCBC framework provided more training with, for example, the CISA of the uh, United States. So they provided some the open source the training uh, evaluation, uh, sorry, cybersecurity evaluation framework. And also we have, uh, now we are planning to provide more training uh, in coordination with the FCD of uh, United Kingdom and ITU and more other organization. So that's through this AJCCBC program. So uh, this is a kind of a training center for ASEAN region, but also this AJCCBC has a kind of the coordination function to meet the, the needs of the ASEAN and also uh, to reduce uh, the duplication or something like that. So, okay, that's all, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing uh, one concrete example of two projects collaborating uh, in order to uh, avoid duplication and also for sharing uh, the existence of this center, which I believe probably also other donors you know, beyond ASEAN and those that you have mentioned could actually collaborate with in order to improve uh, coordination uh, within the, the Asian region. So I would invite everybody who's working in that region actually then probably to get in touch with you and try to understand better how to work together uh, in that, through that center, because it's not only a physical center, but it's actually a, it's also actually a coordination mechanism. Um, yeah, Luis, um, same question for you. Uh, insufficient coordination, uh, consequences, and the, some of the mechanisms that you might have identified to improve uh, coordination. Absolutely, and we're, we're right at the last mile, let's say, <laughs> right now of the, of, of the panel. Um, yes, I, I also don't want to kind of um, say the same. I think we're all biased over here. We, we understand very, very nicely the landscape and the challenges. Uh, but I think in terms of fragmentation of, ex of, of efforts, um, I would say that one of the consequences is really leading to poor sustainab sustainability measurement. Um, and that goes from like an individual, let's say donor or recipient country, uh, but or also from like different donor countries trying to assess the landscape, right? I think, um, you know, we, we don't have necessarily good measurements for longer term sustainability efforts. Um, I think we're very good in measuring KPIs for like an immediate project that you're implementing. Uh, but once you've implemented the project, you know, I, I think that longer term element, because of so many other layers, right, I think uh, Regine um, alluded to like the bureaucracy of government, right, and how sometimes it's very hard to keep track of, of things beyond the financial year. Um, so I think we need to be very realistic of how do we then build uh, effective measure um, measurements um, in terms of sustainability and over a longer period of time. Is that something that should be discussed in other fora uh, internationally? Is that something that we should talk more about, um, uh, be it at the ITU, be it at the UN, whatever works, um, of making those two communities meet, the CCB and the development community? Um, so that also leads to a higher propensity of a one-off efforts or effects, right? I mean, so you only measure impact in, like, I implemented a project, then you know, you measure impact based on that particular project, so you don't have a holistic view. Um, and I don't think that's something that's just applicable to donor countries or implementer or, or recipient countries, I think implementers as well, you know, like organizations, civil society organizations, think tanks that are working on this, you know, it's having a bigger measurement of like, how do we actually see this as more than a one-off? Um, is there something on the recommendations that for you as an organization, and I can say from a think tank perspective, right, having conducted CCB in different countries um, and also helped in the implementation, I think it's like, how do you actually provide recommendations that are sustainable Sustainable? Is it about developing a, a, a longer term, you know, capacity building program in a region, right? Uh, so I think we need to think uh, more about that um, in terms of also other consequences from the domestic um, domestically from the donor side, I already alluded to this. So there are multiple departments dealing with different types of capacity building efforts uh, within different governments. So one example, and it's not to, to put 
the US on the spotlight, but like for example, with Costa Rica and the Conti kind of ransomware incident, uh, you had USAID kind of providing some, some support, and then you had now the Foreign Military Fund providing other types of support to Costa Rica, right? Which shows that there are different parts of government that are doing different types of CCB. Um, whether they're coordinating, and I have no insight into the particularities of the, the US government, definitely, uh, but I think from a person that has been observing from the outside and the public information that we see, I think there's, this is something to consider, right, in, in terms of, let's say, the consequences of insu insufficient coordination from a, a donor perspective internally. Um, and then domestically from the recipient side, um, this can lead to really, like, overwhelming effect when recipient countries really have lots of offers. Um, that is assuming a very good scenario where you have like a country that's receiving, but from a crisis response CCB perspective, and going back to what I said previously, when you look at countries such as uh, Montenegro, right? So we hosted, RUSI, we hosted um, a discussion over at the open-ended working group at the sidelines on thinking about ransomware and requests for assistance, right? And we discussed with, um, with the colleague from Montenegro was talking about how when they were attacked, it was very hard for them to actually designate one POC to respond to the multiple countries that were trying to support at that moment. So that is a, a good scenario where you actually have lots of countries wanting to support, um, but then you actually need to be realistic internally of whether you do have a POC, do you have a national cybersecurity agency that has the authority to do that? Uh, so I think there are lots of different nuances to thinking about coordination domestically uh, domestically from the recipient side, from the donor side, and also from organizations that are trying to measure sustainability more broadly. Very shortly on mechanisms. Um, so still sticking to my breaking down the, the discussion and the language and the terminology around CCB, um, I think more broadly as I discussed, you know, the mechanisms that we have for broader CCB are already out there. I think they're MOUs. For example, you know, Australia has done a very interesting work throughout the past couple of years of tying, you know, the BOA declaration, you know, looking at the Pacific Island countries, then tying kind of like particular parts of, um, of let's say, funds to do training on certs within the region. So I think there's like a sequencing of actions and there are MOUs that come before that that are renovated after a while. So I think, you know, these are things that have been working quite well in different regions. There are different experiences. Uh, when it comes to crisis response mechanisms, um, I think there's still a lot of experimentation on how government seeks to institutionalize this um, from, let's say, Costa Rica, Vanuatu, PNG, and others. Uh, what, you know, just from a research perspective, what we've observed is that all of them have been preceded by MOUs, almost all of them. So countries that provided assistance in the context of a crisis already had a previous relationship. So we go back to the point on trust and how you actually have to build that trust before you actually conduct any kind of um, assistance. Uh, but there are other also evolving mechanisms such as the in the EU there's the PESCO framework and there's the, um, the cyber rapid response teams which is a way of getting particular types of countries within the EU to respond to a particular crisis like cyber crises. So that's still an experimental stage even though the PESCO framework has been there for a couple of years. I think this is a one way of thinking about how mechanisms can be explored within a group of countries. And, uh, and finally, when we're talking about, you know, crises, CCB, I think we need, we see some, some mechanisms that kind of go back to the broader lens of CCB. So one other example that we've identified is that Slovenia, France, Montenegro, they set up a center for cybersecurity capacity building in the Western Balkans in 2022. And that is an example of like Montenegro faced a very large scale cyber incident, uh, was a ransomware, then they have received crisis response assistance and now they're going back to like what are the mechanisms that we can build together to have a longer tail, sustainable impact and how different countries can come together to actually institutionalize that. So I think we need to see those different types of CCB as complementing each other depending on the context. And I think that last example just shows that you can go from crisis response back to like a broader CCB lens and use the crisis response as an opportunity for that political visibility to set up new mechanisms. So hopefully, you know, that provides a bit of a, a, an idea of the landscape based on this typology, let's say. 
Absolutely, thank you. Um, you touched upon so many important points, the issue of sustainability, uh, trying to find also long-term sustainability mechanisms. Also from our perspective, I think try to have um, a broader understanding of the impact, so beyond the single project, I think that would be great, and I don't think it exists, unfortunately. I, I'm sure that all European funded projects somehow have to, uh, to demonstrate the impact, but that really happens at the project level, but what about then globally, right, observing the impact of all these projects, what will be the result? Do they look at sustainability? So thanks a lot for that. And also um, some of the, uh, of the mechanisms and how, as you said, from cyber crisis, we can actually then identify other uh, more long-term kind of mechanisms on coordination. I think those are uh, great examples, those that you, uh, that you highlighted. Uh, Regina, uh, you are yeah, the, the last one in our, um, in our table. So um, is there anything else that you would like to, to add on insufficient coordination and uh, some of the mechanisms that maybe Germany put in place to improve coordination in cyber capacity building? Yeah, uh, not to be repetitive, I would like to just throw some you know, some ideas around and we see if we can follow up then in the discussion. The first one is that I would like to flag that there is often a misunderstanding what coordination actually is. Uh, and I have to explain it also in my own system that coordination does not mean telling other people what they should do. Um, I mean, we have, for example, a very, uh, I mean, a, a situation that is perhaps uh, familiar for also for, for other members of government here. You know, ministers traveling want some deliverables, so come up with a project. So this is a, a, a way of um, establishing a, a cyber capacity building project that is not, that cannot be coordinated in the same way that something that, you know, when you start with a white sheet of paper and just, you know, um, map it out uh, according to the needs of the recipients. So this is a, this, this coordination then uh, with, with this kind of projects means that I just go to the coordination meeting and tell them, okay, that's what I'm going to do because there is no leeway on my side to do something different or to choose a different recipient. Um, a second element, of course, like in all development cooperation, there are darlings, darling recipients and others. And um, we are aware of that but um, a coordination mechanism should also help us to overcome this bias that we always lean towards certain recipients who are well prepared to receive our uh, assistance. Um, then you mentioned the Montenegro Center. What I was very uh, not surprised, but what, was what became very visible in, for example, the Albania case, uh, of when the ransomware um, um, attack hit them was that they turned towards uh, help, also emergency support, far, far away from the US, from France, from others. They didn't ask their neighbors, mm -hmm. although there might be some familiarity with the structures, you know, arguments to, uh, to ask the neighbors. So I would say a mechanism or mechanisms should also look for, uh, you know, regional cooperation, uh, not only global cooperation or, you know, I mean, in cyberspace there are no borders, so neighbor, neighborhood doesn't mean uh, the same thing as in the analog world, but nevertheless, also in cyberspace, there are reasons to ask your neighbors for help. Um, mechanisms, I mean, what is really necessary, uh, Claire mentioned the D4D hubs, what I also find very uh, promising is uh, the regional tables that the uh, ex European External Action Service is setting up with regard, for example, to the Western Balkans, now also for Moldova, to integrate foreign policy and security policy considerations and development or uh, assistance considerations. So to bring these two uh, aspects or two perspectives together because uh, it, it is often... Uh, you know, development cooperation seeks to be not so political, more technical, but of course there are many reasons to integrate these technical perspective with a more foreign policy perspective. And then uh, something that I would also like to add is we have, a, I think we there is a good case for don on the donor side to 
to have also a top-down approach with regard to coordination. So starting with the language and with the, with the paragraphs that we have in the OEWG reports and GG report from 2021, because there is a good outline of what capacity, cyber capacity building is like. There is this very good idea and expression and notion of a two-way street. And we haven't talked about this yet, but I think cyber capacity building should in principle be a two-way street so that there is also, uh, you know, north, south, south, north, south, south, north, north cooperation included and not only, you know, a donor recipient relationship uh, as in, in development uh, cooperation. So that rep the um, reports on the cyber norms provide us with a very good general concept and what we have now un in in the discussion the program of action will even give will give us more opportunities to also have it in a sustainable way so not reopen the case uh, every 5 years and renegotiate the same document but um, have a more long term perspective of what, of where we would like um, to um, arrive one day Thank you, thank you very much, um, Regina, for highlighting some <coughs> of the, um, you know, how regional cooperation could actually improve these um, coordination uh, mechanisms and the fact that not always that is actually uh, the preferred way to ask uh, for support. Thank you for highlighting the, the example of um, um, Albania, um, having the um, Montenegro center. Um, uh, next to uh, next to them, and also uh, it's very interesting on how uh, these uh, new um, uh, discussions on linking policy consideration and development considerations are actually not growing. So that the political aspects and the technical one somehow are trying also to uh, to find uh, a way to have a better uh, better dialogue. And then of course uh, for those that are not familiar. I would invite all of you to, to read the open-ended working group um, final report on responsible state behavior in cyberspace, which highlights some of the principles of cyber capacity building, and one of those is these two-way streets, right? And the fact that the relationships between donor and recipient, south and north, needs to be revised and understand that, that are actually on a better equal base also on cyber capacity building. So I would like to open up now the floor to some questions or additional comments before we wrap up and conclude. Uh, okay, there is somebody, yeah, you can start. Thank you. Hi, I, I'm, I'm an attorney, I'm a lawyer, so I like to consider legal basis as being a sustainable way going forward. And it, it occurred to me, of course, there are different things that we doc talked about, and OEWG is also more of just resolutions that basically been passed. But the Budapest Convention provides a legal basis, and, and I was thinking about the work that at least I've done with them and, and the things that it, it, it helps doing. They have sustainability because of the legal basis. I'll, I'll mention three things. The, the first is the, the legal basis. The second is that their capacity building programs make sure that they don't do what we call drive-by trainings. Uh, if they're training judges, they'll make sure that the training is done it is localized, and then after that, those trainers are gonna train others. And not only that, but the point you made about South-South cooperation, uh, an African judge in Ghana, this, I mean, I, I was part of this just a few weeks ago, trained judges in Kenya, as an example. So that's helpful. And someone from Philippines is training someone in Morocco, for instance, this, this happens uh, under their auspices. And also, it, the TCY, which is the Committee for the uh, Council of Europe, allows a measurable mechanism, which is global for all countries to check what you're doing when it comes to capacity building with these things, and they do this co consistently, maybe not be too public, but it's something to look into. And finally, uh, of course, they do regional cooperation constantly for Albania, Montenegro. I've, I've been part of many of these exercises where they had many of these countries get together. Uh, but the most important one, and I'll leave you with this, is the point of contact, the 24-7 network, which allows you basically to have a stable, legally international law compliant, domestic law compliant, sustainable point of contact where everybody can get in touch and talk to each other. And it's not something we're saying, well, which country does what? No, every country has one point of contact designated, known who they are. If there's a problem, they know exactly who to contact. So this, this might be uh, just one alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments, for adding some of um, other mechanisms for coordination, more from a, a legal perspective. I think that was great. So I'm wondering if somebody would like to address the question on um, yeah, the legal basis for cyber capacity building, because that's something actually we didn't touch upon. For sustainability and better coordination. Is there anybody who would like to? Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because actually the, 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 there are not and uh, uh, probably that could be also a way of creating more, more, more clarity and uh, yeah, somehow to address some of, the, uh, of these issues. I think it's a good At the risk question. of repeating, I'm sorry, my apologies. No it wasn't really a question for, the, uh, for the, the panel. I'm not expecting we should have legal basis for capacity building, not at all. I'm just saying that there are legal basis in, in, stat in uh, treaties which have capacity building programs that bring that sustainability and maybe using them more is, is something to think about. The donors should be looking at it and saying, hey, that's something stable, that's, that provides structure, it's legally sustainable uh, on an international basis as well as domestic basis. That's okay. the point, thank yeah. you. Actually, thank you. also understanding it as a tasking for both sides, both donors and recipients, if you want, or partners in crime here. Thank you, thank you very much for that. There was another question. Thank you so much, and thank you so much again to the panelists and this very comprehensive points of view from different regions and different expertises, so thank you for that. So my question slash comment, um, so first of all, I'm Yasmin. I work in the ITU in uh, actually cyber capacity building project implementation. So many of the things that were mentioned really resonated, and my question is related to this challenge of demand-driven capacity building because, um, you know, donors obviously have different political priorities, uh, different budgets and everything that was mentioned as well. But we need to remember that this is not only a cybersecurity issue. Um, there are a lot of lessons learned that can be learned from the development world. Uh, I mean, there's decades of development work being done. There are mechanisms in place like, uh, you know, donor pledging conferences, donor coordination conferences. And so something that on the donor side that can be done is also at national level to look into what is being done in other, you know, uh, government agencies and other divisions to see if there's any lessons learned there. And of course, at national level, this can be looked into so that it's improved at international level. So in short, my question is basically, you know, how can donor co countries uh, uh, look into inside in their national um, uh, lessons learned when it comes to development uh, so that we can improve on demand-driven uh, cyber capacity building? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. One of our uh, donors' country would like to answer to the question. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, I think the D4D Hub actually is that I mentioned earlier um, gives a very good platform to do that. And what we aim, at least what we aim to do within the, the cyber thematic working group, is to do exactly that. So to have um, the technical level people to share what good la what good practices lessons learned what went wrong in your project um, and how to do it better to really pr provide an informal platform to exchange on that basis um, sometimes it's a bit difficult actually to gather uh, that information that you that you mentioned that and that is actually the the important um, uh, the important elements that we need in the inception in the formulation of a project um, so yeah I think uh, the D4D hub provides a very good uh, stage for that but Teresa would like. Teresa, please. Is it on now? Yes, okay. Thank you, Yasmin, also for your question. Uh, I think it's an important point of connecting, actually, learning from the development community, but also connecting uh, the development community um, with the cyber uh, community, which is also something of quite an interest uh, for the GFC. Uh, and um, we are together with our partners organizing a conference on global cyber capacity building in, in Ghana at the end of November, and this is exactly one of the one of the objectives to bring these communities uh, together a little bit more for more efficiency in the future. Hopefully, thank you, Teresa uh, Regina. Yeah, I would like to add one aspect, and that is that it it is it is also true in the other way around. If you do dev digital development cooperation, so development cooperation for digital transformation or for digital. Uh, transition of public administration or so, you should include the cyber capacity building part, you know, because it's not, it doesn't make sense to, to kind of help uh, an administration transition to a digital system without including um, enhancing their skills, their capabilities, also, you know, the hardware and software part f that is necessary for good cyber security. Uh, so, I would say it's also the other way around. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Donia, probably there is an online 
Yes. Question. Yes, we do have a question from online participants. First off, a response to Claire's very early intervention, just support for regarding trust as an enabler for capacity building. So that was a just support for that intervention. And then the question is, um, can we see capacity building as end-to-end -end across the whole community rather than just technology solutions? And what are the panels we use on thinking of capacity building as more than just technology solutions, but also building community awareness, legislation framework, or government policies, et cetera? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for that. Is there anybody who would like to answer to that? Um, I think my understanding is trying to see it beyond the technical issues, right? But rather on building awareness, uh, legal basis, and so on and so forth. I think if I understood correctly the question, please. Um, yes, sure. Um, and and thank you for the question. Um, I think maybe I'm biased <laughs> uh, because I, I I feel that that we probably, you know, bursted that bubble a lot. And I think a huge part of that effort, I, you know, I, I take my hat off for the, the GFC, the Global Foreign and Cyber Expertise, which tries to provide that platform, you know, so they're working groups on, you know, incident response and their groups on like cyber diplomacy and norms, right? Um, and, and those kinds of communities in the coffee break kind of meet up. And I think that's, you know, it's about those small kind of efforts in the sense of like mixing those communities and having the space to do that. Um, so yeah, so I think from my perspective, those communities have like that, the CCB discussion across communities is gradually um, at the international level, right, through the, these mechanisms kind of progressed. But for sure, when you look domestically, right, depending on the country, depending on the culture, uh, depending on, you know, where in the development spectrum they're in, it's still very challenging, right? I remember work, so working in, in my previous job, like in a think tank based in Brazil, right, sometimes speaking to different departments across the government or people that were working more on CCB for like, let's say, certs, it's a very different kind of community. So I think there's also this effort of us at least from civil society organizations or think tanks to try to do that as much as possible when we're planning and designing a particular project, right? I think that's part of like, how do we design that engagement with those communities as much as possible in our own, let's say, stakeholder group. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Luis, for that. So we only have four minutes left. So very quickly before we conclude, uh, I would like to invite the panelists to provide I would say maximum two takeaways or recommendations then to improve cyber capacity building um, coordination. Rita. Okay, um, thank you Enrico for and that. Be brief, sorry. Oh, okay, you, sorry, you sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so effective cyber capacity building um, actually requires multifaceted approach and a very sustained commitment from donors, from implementers, and as well as um, recipients. So drivers and coordinators of such efforts should be intentional about onboarding uh, new strategic members such that the voices of all parties are diversified and initiatives do not remain uh, stale due to uh, having the same players at the table at all times. So by working together and following these actions, then uh, we can effectively enhance a national cybersecurity resilience and capabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Teresa. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, let's consider this openness uh, that we want to build to the extent possible as a win-win-win situation. Uh, and without wanting to sound uh, pathetic, uh, you know, uh, let's, um, uh, let's really try to uh, talk more and exchange more. Yes, thank you. Claire? Thank you. I just have one major point. So I think I really believe that it's um, donors as well as implementers' role to really promote and carry out uh, awareness-raising measures, enhance communication, and facilitate uh, cooperation amongst uh, actors and bring relevant parties together and facilitate knowledge and information sharing uh, as much as possible. I think that's yeah my main point. Thanks. Anatoly? I believe my main point is we, we need a people-centric approach in all the cybersecurity. So we need to reduce the complexity of tools to protect and to rethink from, from scratch the entire cybersecurity uh, architecture of states. So having a good strategy is what we need, and uh, probably we need to put more effort in the strategy and rethinking the existing uh, ecosystem instead of putting layers of security on top of badly designed things. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hiroto. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, um, 
so through this uh, discussion, so of course that the coordination is very important uh, with the multi-stakeholder or the bilateral uh, to reduce the, uh, the deprecation or to maximize the development impact. But also we must think about the sustainability uh, uh, from the coordination perspective. So that the, so we, we should not, uh, of course we can reduce the, some deprecation, but we should not provide one training or one awareness or one meeting or something like that. That's, that's not a good way. So we should uh, create something like a kind of the sustainable outcomes or sustainable outputs. So that's the, uh, we can coordinate real-time coordinate with the stakeholders that uh, real-time are online, but also I think through that kind of a sustainable outcome, such as the, the guidelines or the training materials or trained trainer and so on, so that we can, and also we need, we can refer to such a sustainable outcomes or sustainable outputs so that we can a kind of the delayed or time difference the coordination. So not the real-time, but the maybe we leave, uh, Jacob will leave the, the one country, but the maybe later one donor will uh, join that country. So then that, can, that donor, if that donor can see our outcome so that we can, we, didn't, we need, don't need to talk, but uh, we can uh, coordinate later after, the, after we leave. That's Thank you very much, Hiroko. Uh, Luis. Wonderful, three key points, uh, definitely. First, I'd say both from like what us like you know, think tanks, implementers, uh, or, and, and others, and also like, you know, recipients, you know, include um, recipients in the design phase, right? I think we can do that. That is a very practical element that we can do, be it providing a bigger inception phase for projects where we actually get to engage with stakeholders at then. So I think from an implementer's perspective, that is great. From a donor perspective, I think it's also about thinking what you need to embed that while, um, you know, to embed that in the timeline. Second, we need to really, and that's my, my point since the start, really break down uh, the typology. We, re, we re need to design a typology, actually, uh, to thinking about CCB that accounts for the different contexts as we see the landscape evolving in terms of agencies, stakeholders, and, um, and as I said, crises up to conflict um, and post-conflict um, situations. And finally, on the South-South point, I would also say that, you know, there's, there's a next step for developing countries to also kind of, um, you know, empower their development agencies or to also kind of bring more of the cyber into the development agencies, right? Sometimes it's a different part of the government that's doing that, but I think there is a, a remodeling thing. There's an, a, a, an element of, of bringing cyber into that. So I would say these are my three key points. Thank you very much, Luis. And Regine. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I think I have nothing to add, so <laughs> amen. It was a lot, no, no, no problem at all. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much for all our panelists, for sharing your experience and, uh, and insight, and of course for all participants. Yeah, uh, we conclude our, our session, thanks a lot. But the, the conversation, of course, doesn't end here. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs>